We're continuing our series called What If Jesus Was Serious? And we're looking at the Gospels in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 and what's commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount. And in this passage, uh, this beautiful, eloquent sermon, uh, Jesus is going to speak and teach on some real practical aspects of a godly life, of following him and what that looks like. And he uses exaggerations and overstatements to make a point, but make no mistake about it, Jesus was serious. And this world that we live in needs a church, believers in Jesus Christ, that actually take his word, word seriously. Because if we don't take his word seriously as followers of him, then how can we expect others to believe he is who he says he is if they don't see people living these out? And so this is the invitation we have. And today, the title of my message is Hope Beyond Wealth. Hope Beyond Wealth. And I want to ask you, what is your most prized possession? What is your most prized possession? And uh, it may have changed throughout stages of your life, but currently, what is your most prized possession? Um, I've got this ring right here that I think is pretty special to me. And uh, not because it's made of white gold and not because the jewelry store said it's worth what it is, not because someone had to mine the materials out of the dirt and make it into an extra, extra large circle to fit my finger. The reason this is special to me is not because of the material's shape or size, because it's a reminder of the commitment I have to my wife. It's a symbol of something bigger and more important than it itself, and it's something that uh, is more valuable to me than it is to you. And it should be because there's this relationship and covenant commitment that is from my dear wife. Also in our house there, uh, we've got two girls and a dog. And uh, we also have another family member that you may not know and I brought uh, with me today. But this is Snowflake. <laughs> now, Snowflake doesn't mean anything to me. But to my six-year-old, Snowflake is a must. I can go away on a trip and be gone for the night. Snowflake cannot. We can travel. Snowflake has to come. There will be crying and yelling and no one is sleeping in our house if Snowflake gets lost. This is super important to my six-year-old. Now, if there comes a day when a young gentleman comes into her life, asks for her hand in marriage, I will be on one arm walking her down the aisle, but Snowflake better not. <laughs> She's got to be able to grow beyond the point where she needs Snowflake in her life. But yet, like so many young children, we grow out of maybe a stuffed animal, but there's other things we cling to, hoping that it will provide protection, comfort, and joy. And we call this money, materials, and possessions. But if you've ever found out that a lot of times you get lied to. You see, growing up in the 90s, um, I began collecting things. This right here is a Wheaties box with Ken Griffey Jr. on it um, from the mid-90s. It still has the Wheaties in it. It's been unopened. I am not saving this in case we ran out of food. That was never the desire. But I saved it in the hopes of one day it would be worth more than $3.99. Well, just going by the rate of current Wheaties, it's about worth $6.99 um, right now if you were to buy that at Walmart without the box. But I was told as a young man, don't get rid of those. Save them because by the time you turn 40, you may be able to retire. <laughs> Oh, the lies I was told. And so from 1993 to 2000, I began buying and saving everything I could. This right here is a pennant. They used to make these year by year. And this is of Ken Griffey Jr. and Ken Griffey Sr. When they both played for the Mariners. And they actually this year hit back-to-back -back home runs. 
An amazing moment in baseball history. The father hit a home run, and then the son hit a home run, and when the son came home, there was the father. I'm going to start preaching. You've got to be careful. I can turn anything into a message. There was the father standing wet, ready to embrace his son as he came home. I don't even know if my wife knows I have all these things. She does now. And then there was this. The trading card booklet. This is what you kept your cards in and these protective sleeves. They're all stuck together because I haven't opened this in decades now. But this is what you brought to your friend's house trying to rip them off. This is what you literally brought and you were trying to trade cards and not trade evenly. You were trying to get the better deal. And so older kids would hang out with younger kids trying to convince them that if you give me this one card, I'll give you four cards. But they were four cards of lesser players and lesser value. And, um, you know, I collected these as well. And then there were the untouchables. The ones you put in a single hard case. The ones that you were not willing to trade. The ones that you would be on a beach in Maui in in 30 years, not having to worry about a thing in the world, about what time to get up, what time to go to bed, and how much sunscreen to put on. I kept these in hopes that they would make me rich. I don't know if I could take my family to Red Robin right now if I traded these in. (laughs) You see, because there was a generation before me that when they went to college, their moms just found their baseball cards and threw them away. That was my dad's story. When he went off to central Washington, my grandma went through his room and she just said, this is just junk. And she threw it away. And my dad came home and found out he was devastated. So his instruction to me, never throw it away. And so from 1993 to the year 2000, every birthday I got money, Every Christmas gift, we would go to the store and I would spend all my money on cards. In the belief that one day it would make my life easier. It would make me more wealthy. It would make me not have to work. Well, guess what? Tomorrow I'm still going to have this junk and I'm still showing up to work. It was a misplaced hope in values, in materials, things, and possessions. We live in a world full of collectibles, don't we? Maybe you have a collection of some sort of something. Maybe it's even worth some money to someone somewhere. But how things get assigned value is fascinating. Recently, at a place called Golden Auctions, this Pokemon card sold for $5.275 million dollars. That wasn't the buyer. That was Nick Sandy putting my face on the buyer. (laughs) I don't know if someone told the guy that bought it, it's a piece of cardboard with printed ink on it. Yeah, but it's one of one. It's in mint condition. And the exclusivity of it has drawn the attention and resources, I could think of about 5.275 million ways I would spend that money besides on that card. It's crazy, isn't it? But it's so easy to look at other people and see how they use their resources instead of God allowing himself to look at us to see what we're doing. You see, what we do with our resources, our time, Our possession, our money, our materialism shows our lives what we think is of ultimate value. And we can tend to put our hope, happiness, and security in wealth. I got to work with teenagers for a long time. For 16 years, I was a youth pastor. And, and, and statuses have changed and goals and achievements have changed and life is getting more expensive, isn't it? Man, it's, 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 it's not just 
adding a little bit. It's actually multiplying. There was recently someone that just replaced their Walmart order that they did four years ago, and it was now three times more expensive than it was the same order for the same things four years ago. And so life's getting more expensive, and, and there's this, this imagery in our minds, especially living in America, and the goal for most teenagers now is simply this one word, to be rich. To be rich. Because we've put a number on happiness. We talk about what jobs you can get that earn a certain amount. When we talk about people, we talk about their net worth. When we look at our sports stars and they sign new contracts, we don't just talk about the number of years they're going to be on the team. We talk about how much money they get for the number of years they're going to be on our team. And so we live in a culture that's fascinated with the dollar, that's fascinated with stocks and Bitcoin. I mean, we're even creating like currencies to try to get rich. And we check our bank accounts all the time. We look at our investment portfolios. We're constantly shopping for the newest and greatest to replace what we already have. And we've come to believe that who really has the most stuff wins. And that's the culture we're living in. And living in America in 2024, we have to recognize that because it all it impacts each and every one of us. And if we're not careful, it begins to consume us. And so today, the main idea for my message is this. If Jesus was serious, then heavenly treasure will matter more than earthly junk. Because ultimately, that's what a lot of it ends up being, isn't it? What you buy at Walmart on Amazon Prime today will either end up in a trash can or end up in one of these really soon. Aren't these fascinating? They just hide our junk in an organized way. We stack it and it makes it seem like less cluttered because we now have it organized and it's put in there. This is why Costco is so brilliant. Every spring they put these right as soon as you walk in the door because they know you have the intention of getting rid of things, but you really can't get rid of anything. And so you just need to organize it in a less seen, less known, less cluttered way. And they make money off of it. They are brilliant. But we're all attached to something. And how we relate to our money and possessions tells us the truth about what we value and believe. And that's why it's important to Jesus. And it should be important to us. Our world is consumed by the accumulation of money and possessions. I mean, we like good deals and bargains and sales. But even a sale, all it is is a reduced cost. It's not actually what it costs to make. And that's why they put limits on it. You get an email, hey, for the next 24 hours, it's 50% off. Plus an additional 10%. And you think you're saving money all while spending money. Can I tell you, anytime you're spending money, you're not saving any money. You're spending. And so, but they, 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 they know that our heart wants to make this urgency and we like good deals and we don't have very much self-control. And so marketing teams are experts at getting you to want more. We have online shopping. We have Amazon Prime promising it can be there between 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. the next day. We have malls and department stores. We don't even just have clothes. We have fashion. <laughs> Which means that some things are seasonable or tied to current times. We don't want to just be clothed. We want to be clothed with the current, with the nicest, with the best. We'll even put logos on it to show people how much we paid for it. We like toys and gadgets and electronics. We like cars, trucks, boats, motorcycles and RVs. And then we build storage facilities for these things. You want to know what matters to someone? Walk in their house, their garage, their office, their shop, and look at their junk. You want to know what matters? You come to our house. You can tell where my wife decorates and where I do. Where does my wife decorate? 
all the places people are going to see. Where do I decorate? The garage. That's where I, so like when people come over, I'm like, open the garage, check out my stuff. Because everything else in the house is pretty and neat and beautiful and pictures of our family and decorative. And I'm like, show me some antlers on the wall. That's what I'm talking about. (laughs) And somehow that does not make the decor in the house. Pray for us. But each of us need to examine how we think about wealth and possessions. It's a big deal. Because we spend so much of our lives working neglecting time with family and friends, and we end up using that resource sometimes on stuff that doesn't matter. It's just junk. And Jesus talks about that. Let's look at how he asked us to examine it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. He says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters since either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And you cannot serve both God and money. And so Jesus is giving and continuing this sermon. This isn't a different sermon. We're taking six weeks to walk through his one sermon and we're not even able to hit everything in it. But he's talking to them about this godly life in a messed up world. He's talking about living with a clean and pure heart in a world that has so many temptations and so many things that tries to get its claws in you to distract you and change the direction of your life. And he turns here and he was talking about spiritual disciplines before to being practically disciplined. To how does these spiritual disciplines, this praying and giving and and, and serving and loving one another, how does this begin to live itself out? And he asks us to examine ourselves. You see, an examination is designed to give us information about the internal and the unseen. I went to the doctor this week. They asked me to do some things, and I couldn't believe they were asking me to do it. They asked me to step on a scale. (laughs) How dare them? Don't they know that's an invasion of my privacy? They put a cuff on my arm and began to squeeze it, trying to determine what my blood pressure was. They began putting a stethoscope on different parts of my body, listening to my breathing. They had the nerve to put their fingers on my wrist and measure my pulse. Don't they know I'm right there and I'm alive? (laughs) What are they doing? They're trying to measure the unseen to help give indicators of what may be to come if there's unhealth inside. And that's what scripture does for us. That's why it's important that we open and learn from the word of God because we can be convinced we're good. We can be convinced that we're healthy. We can be convinced that everything's okay. I feel good. I look good. I run good. I play good. And he gets to the doctor and he's like, you ain't good. (laughs) There's some internal issues that if you leave unaddressed, will lead to further complications down the road. And so we open ourselves up to that examination medically. And sometimes we're even resistant to it. But spiritually, Jesus is using this to examine our hearts. You see, how do you know if you're good when it comes to your money, possessions, and stuff? How do we know that we're living a life that God wants us to free from the burden of just pursuing materialism. And Jesus would emphasize that few things have greater impact on your spiritual condition than money and possessions. It's actually one of the number one topics he continually addressed in people's hearts. And it's one of the number one things that you're like, Pastor, you preach about it so much. Well, because Jesus talked about it, and if we're going through Scripture, we can't just skip over the things he talked about. 
It's in the default setting of human hearts to be selfish and have misplaced values. And so I want to ask this question, how is money, materialism, and possessions impacting your internal condition? Because if it's impacting your internal condition, it's affecting the direction for your eternal destination. You see, our internal condition, where our heart is, where our desires is, God wants to renew and transform. So it sends us on a life where we don't live for ourselves, but we live for him, for his glory and to tell his story. And so Jesus uses three examples here. And he talks about two contrasting choices that we can find freedom and hope. And the first is this. He talks about two treasures. One is earthly treasure and the other is heavenly treasure. Now, it's important for us to understand money and possessions and clothes, they're not evil. They're neutral. They're neither good nor bad. They're neutral. Now, what our heart clings and holds on to, how we see things, view things, and treat things, then becomes the issue. There's wisdom in saving. The Bible talks about an ant storing up. To prepare for days ahead, there's wisdom in saving. There's wisdom in investing. There's good godly instruction in looking towards the care of your family and others. This life is a gift to enjoy. God hasn't given us this life that we won't have any pleasure. It's just not that pleasure will become our number one priority. Vacations can be amazing. They can be restful and to experience places that God has created is a gift. But the danger that we all face is we can look to wealth and possessions to provide security and joy. And they can't. Only God can. And we work so hard with our lives, spend so many hours working for an hourly wage or a salary. And we are to work. Scripture teaches us if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Like, there should be a, an ethic inside of us that, that wants to work to provide. But there's a difference between working to provide and working to establish self-worth. And if your self-identity is found in a job title or in an income amount, if it's found in the brand of car you drive or the square feet of your house, those are false identities that will crack and crumble, that will ultimately fade away. He uses this phraseology to a, 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 a Middle Eastern context that we have to think about a little bit. He says, don't store up for yourself things that moth and rust destroy. Their homes weren't insulated. They didn't have air conditioning. He talks about where thieves break in and take everything from you. There was no banks to hold your money. Everything you had was in your possession. And they would guard this and hold this tightly because their present and their future in their minds were predicated on what they currently had. They didn't have closets full of clothes. They didn't have, they didn't have storage units and they didn't have banks. They literally had physical possessions. There was a debt system that they could go into, but that ended up being not in order to help people, but to enslave them. And so Jesus is speaking to him and saying, don't store up stuff for yourself. And I'm sure all of them thought what many of us think. Well, I don't have enough as it is. I mean, we are convinced that if we had more, we'd be better. If we just made a little bit more money at our job, if we just won that scratch ticket, if we just got a different job or if our spouse got a job and earned more money, that we'd be better. We've convinced ourselves of that. And many times we'd use that quote unquote better just to fill our lives with more junk. Bigger houses to store more junk. Four or five, six car garages to fill it with more junk. Like we just fill our lives with these possessions and these shelves and these displays and it ends up just being hollow at the end of the day. Many people end up passing away and they never got rid of their junk and their kids have to go through their junk. And if you've ever been in that place, you're like, why did they keep this? Why did they never part with this? And now why do I have to? So we put it on Facebook Marketplace hoping that someone else sees our crap as treasure. 
and they'll give us money for it. And it's this exchange that we live in in this community where like we just trade these worthless things with one another. Hoping that it fills our lives with hope and joy. And Jesus says, don't store up for yourself earthly treasure, but heavenly treasure. Now, what is heavenly treasure? Now, I know what earthly treasure is. It's monies, it's, it's cars, it's clothes, it's purses, it's, it's collectibles. But what is heavenly treasure? And so many times when we think about heaven, we still think about stuff. How many of you ever thought about when Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and you're like, how big? <laughs> how many rooms? Is it oceanfront, Jesus? Because, you know, I've been real good for you, and I never got an oceanfront place on earth, so in heaven, I'd like a view of the water. <laughs> we talk about, like, the sacrifices we make or the challenges we walk through, and we're like, well, you know, I guess that's just another jewel in my crown. And when you get to heaven and Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in. If your first response is, where's my stuff? That sounds pretty hollow, doesn't it? Sounds pretty fruitless and worthless. You see, the joy of heaven is being in his presence, seeing his face experiencing his love, bowing down in worship and joining with all of creation to declare that he is worthy. Amen. He is worthy. In the pictures of heaven, we see this beauty that surrounds the throne room, but it's an imagery to help us understand that even in this most beautiful place we could ever imagine, the beauty and splendor that comes from his throne is even greater. It's a description to help us understand that it all pales in comparison to seeing him face to face. And this life that we make about stuff, junk, Jesus says, I want you to focus on those things that last eternally. And what lasts eternally? Because there's no possession that you get to bring with you to heaven. It all stays on this earth and turns into scrap. It's either going to be given away, sold, or thrown away. It's either going to endure for a little bit or then it's going to get broken and tossed. Like all these things we work so hard for to attain all ends up going away. So what endures in heaven? What is the heavenly treasure? It's what Jesus calls us to do. It's the way we serve and love one another. It's our witness and effectiveness in helping someone see the goodness of God in and through us that they might see that God is real and alive and surrender his life to him. The most beautiful thing that can happen in your life is not what you can attain, but it's a faithful witness that helps someone else see the beauty of God and they surrender their life to him and now their eternal destination is different because of your faithful witness. The joy of heaven is going to be to be in his presence. It's also going to see those that you had impact for his kingdom purpose. Those that you met and knew and those that you never knew. It's why we're on this kingdom mission. It's why we're not here just to accumulate a building full of people and stuff. But we want people that are built up strong in Jesus that begin to see this world differently and begin to see heaven as a reward and the ultimate reward. Amen. And so we make sacrifices and we become generous towards God and towards others. We begin to serve and spend our lives differently for him, not to accumulate more stuff for him, but to give more glory and honor that's due his name. Amen. Because there's two contrasting choices as well. You will have two visions, he says, healthy eyes or bad eyes. All eyes do is allow you to perceive what's out there, to perceive what's outside of you. And if you have healthy eyes, then you see things accurately. If you have bad eyes, you begin to get a distorted, 
unclear or blind picture of what is reality. And Jesus is speaking to him. He says, some of you don't see this world accurately. You're pursuing the wrong things. And if you have healthy eyes, it illuminates. It brings light. It brings goodness. But bad eyes brings darkness. He even says, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? You see, sometimes the enemy doesn't just want to get you to commit one of the ten grievous sins. He wants just to get you distracted, pursuing the wrong things, putting your hope in the wrong areas. And how you see things will either illuminate or darken your life. So when it comes to money and possessions and materials, they either can be used as a tool or they begin to see it as a place of security and safety. As a place where you can begin to provide for yourself to answer for your own needs. Or they can become a tool for God's kingdom. A tool to bless others. A tool to further the work that God is doing around the world. And then the last comparison he makes is you will have two masters. You will either serve God or you will serve money. You see, he says, no one can serve two masters since he will hate one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And then he clarifies. He says, you cannot serve both God and money. You see, resources don't want to just attach us to our hearts. They want to take control. And to serve God is to put money and resources secondary. Not saying that they're bad, but they're just not going to control my life. They're going to be something I evaluate when I make decisions, but it's not the number one factor in the decision. I'm going to seek God and his voice before I even know what the offer is. And not everything added to our life is good. We don't handle everything well. Sometimes we think if we would just get more, we'd be better. And God looks at your heart and says, if I gave you more right now, it'd be disaster. And we have a hard time with that. Sometimes God withholding is actually his blessing because we're not stewarding what we have now well. And a multiplier of what we're not doing with well now becomes an exasperation of our ability and leads us into more bondage. You see, if God can't supply and fill your needs and desires now, him adding more won't be the answer. Because if he's not enough today, more won't be enough tomorrow. But if he's enough today, no matter what comes tomorrow, you will be good with him. You see, he would go on to continue his message in Matthew chapter 6. And he would talk about anxiety. Have you ever battled anxiety before? Man, I have. And what's anxiety? Anxiety is fear, is fear of the unknown from your future coming in as a thief for today. And so he talks about anxiety. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. Why would he say that? Because as soon as he gave them these three examples, he saw worry come over their face. Well, what do you mean don't store up for ourselves here? What do you mean don't make this a priority? How are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to survive? And in a culture with a class system, how do we make it out? How do we rise up? How do we move out of poverty? How do we come out of the throes of Rome? The only hope they saw was in more resource. He says, don't worry what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? Oh, you of little faith. So don't worry saying, what will we eat and what will we drink and what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But then he gives us the answer to all this. In verse 33. 
But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, anxiety is an indicator that I have misplaced values. That I've put my trust in the wrong thing, in the wrong moment, and it's causing something in my life that God never intended. What God is saying is he never designed for you to experience anxiety. You don't pray and seek him and his gifts to you is not like, I'm going to make you more anxious. That's just my gift for you today. No, his gift is a peace that passes our understanding. It's his graciousness. It's his presence. It's his promise that today is going to have its challenges. Face today's challenges with faith and let me take care of tomorrow. And so when you have anxiety, when you worry about what's ahead, when you worry about how you can give more from your life, Jesus is telling them, just keep giving good away. Don't store up for yourself as protection. I've got you. I will take care of you. I'll provide. And if you seek me first, everything else will be added to you. If you seek other things first, many times we get so worried and stressed out that we don't even seek God after Mother Teresa was talking with a man and he was asking her how she could live her life and not worry. She said, I do two things. One, I spend an hour adoring God each day. And then I try to spend 23 hours doing exactly what he said. I spend an hour just thinking about the goodness of God. And then I spent 23 hours trying to do exactly what he said. And she has found if I put my focus there, he takes care of everything else. You see, what you value most occupies the vault of your heart. Where do people place vaults? In the center most secure area. And you each have a vault in your heart. The things that matter most to you. Could you imagine if you went to the bank and, and you wanted to get a, a, a lock off or a lock security box and, and they asked, what do you want to put in it? And you're like, my bread. I just got Dave's killer bread. They were almost out at Costco. Got the last double pack. Was faster with my cart than that lady next to me. Took it right before she could get it. And I'm just going to put it in here until I need it. They would look at you like you were crazy. You'd probably look at yourself like you were crazy. Why? Because it's just, it's just bread. Is it good bread? Oh, it's the best bread. But it's just bread. And we understand that it wasn't important enough to go through all those measures to worry about it. That it wasn't worth the gas down to the bank. It wasn't worth the time waiting in line. It wasn't worth worrying of whether you'd have enough bread. I think God in heaven looks at us many times saying, what are you worried about? What are you anxious about? What are you pursuing? What have you been unwilling to trust me with? What have you been trying to accumulate more of to insulate your life from any challenges or dangers? He said, if you would just seek me, and if you'd seek me first, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of everything you need. If you'll store up for yourself, not earthly treasures, but treasures in heaven, you'll find your life is filled with joy and protection and security because that can only come from him. Because everything else in this world is fading and breaking down and will end up in a garbage heap somewhere. I got my first car when I turned 16. It was a 1985 Toyota Supra. Hatchback, two-door, with lights that popped up. I felt like Knight Rider in that thing. It was red. It was a straight six-speed rear-wheel drive. It looked good. It drove good. It sounded good. And it was fast. And I immediately felt like, this has changed my life. 
I'm the cool kid now with the cool car. Three weeks later, the head gasket blew. Do you know how cool a car is when it has a broken head gasket? Not cool. And I began like, who sold me a broke down car? Well, I did when I bought a car that was 15 years old. That's one of the risks you take. But it looked good on the outside. It sounded good when I drove it. But after a few weeks, it didn't provide what it had promised to for me. And it never promised me anything. I had promised myself that it would provide something for me that it failed to live up to. And in life, we make things, make promises to us that they can never fulfill. Our jobs, our income, our careers, our materials, our possessions. And Jesus is saying, it's all going to go away anyways. It's all going to be a big pile of junk. Moths are going to eat it. Rust is going to break it down. Or someone's going to come take it from you. And if your hope, security, and joy is found in anything that can be taken away from you, at some point it will be. But if your hope, security, and joy is found in something that no one can ever take from you, you can raise up with joy each and every day. You can walk with faith each and every day. Because my hope's not found in something temporary, but it's found in one who is eternal. And he thought I was worth enough that he was willing to go to the cross for me. That he would come down to this earth and he would take a journey. He would live 33 years of faith and faithfulness. Of taking the abuse, taking the neglect, taking the harsh words and ultimately be hung on the cross to redeem my value. Jesus didn't come to earth and say, I'm taking some camels to heaven with me. I'm coming to accumulate some sheep and some gold. He came with you and me on his heart. He came with a lost hurting, addicted, broken world and said you can find security, hope, joy, peace, and salvation in me alone. But many of us live life as immature followers of Jesus holding on to snowflake, thinking we can only sleep at night if our bills are paid, if we've gotten a raise, if Amazon's gonna show up on time, then I'm gonna be good. It's a unicorn. But in someone's mind, she believes that she's better with it. But she's six. Some of us are 60, 46, 32, 25, 18, 16. And we're holding on to things that promise to make us rich, that promise to make things easier, that said if you hold on, it'll be taken care of for you. Do you know what's been occupied in my life? That tub. That tub. And so our hope has to be in something different. Someone different. Someone that will never leave us nor fail us. Someone that cares for us. And when we get to heaven, I hope our heart is, there's my Savior. Not, where's my stuff?